Good afternoon and welcome to City Club of Portland Friday Forum. City Club is where we bring civic-minded people together to make Portland and Oregon a better place to live, work, and play. I'm Karen Curvin, City Club President, and I'd like to welcome members and guests alike, those of you who join us today at Sentinel, and those of you listening on OPB Radio or watching on Portland Community Media. Today we'll hear from Ed Humes, author of Garbology, Our Dirty Love Affair with Trash. But first, some announcements. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures we put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partner, Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum sponsors are Chevron, Girding Edlin, Morel Inc., Northwest Natural, Portland Timbers, and Schwabe, Williamson, and Wyatt. We are grateful for your support and commitment to City Club's mission. Please join me in a warm round of applause for all of them. Next week, we are pleased to partner with Oregon Environmental Council to bring former U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, to City Club. This is a sold-out event. City Club members will have priority seating for the general admission tickets that will be available at the door. July 25th is our final program of the summer. Dr. James Chestnut, chair of TBI Initiative at OHSU's Brain Institute, will interview General Corelli. You can learn more about City Club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, City Club will be live tweeting at today's event. You can follow or mention us at PDX City Club, and be sure to follow the conversation by using the hashtag City Club and Let's Talk Trash in your own tweets. We will be having a Q&A session with our speaker at the end of today's program. Members, please come to the microphone to ask your question. For all of our audience members, please locate the index cards on the center of your tables and write your question on them during the forum. Hold your cards up high and City Club staff will collect them prior to the start of the Q&A. And now for our program. Garbage is one of our nation's biggest exports or is our nation's biggest export or most prodigious product and in many ways our greatest legacy. The average American produces 102 tons of trash in a lifetime, or over seven pounds a day. And we Portlanders, despite our national reputation for green living and sustainability, contribute our share as well. Just as garbage is our biggest export, it's also a largely untapped resource that presents many opportunities. City Club is pleased to welcome Edward Humes, author of Garbology, our dirty love affair with trash, to talk to us today about the impacts of our garbage on our communities and the potential our trash offers for new resources. Ed Humes is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author. In his books, Ed, Ed says that he tries to take readers inside worlds most don't get to visit or see close up on their own. Lately, he is focused on narratives about the environment and sustainability believing this to be the most important story of our age. He has written for numerous publications, including Sierra Magazine, the LA Times, the New York Times, and has taught writing and journalism at UC Irvine, Chapman University, and University of Oregon. Originally, originally from Philadelphia, Ed graduated from Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, and now resides in Southern California. Ed's book includes a chapter on Portland and our successes and ongoing challenges in reducing our waste. He is in Portland as part of Metro's Let's Talk Trash series, which seeks to engage the public in long-term discussions about how we can make the most of the stuff we don't want. Please join me in welcoming Ed Humes to the stage. So really, um, thank you so much for having me here to talk about my favorite subject, trash. It's, uh, cut, let's cut right to the chase. 
Uh, we, and by that I mean we Americans, are a very trashy people. It's literally, as you just heard, the biggest thing we make, our biggest product, our largest export in terms of volume, and our second most valuable export in terms of dollars. Trash, primarily scrap, metal, and paper. America habitually underestimates how much trash we make. We're really bad at keeping track of it. This big thing that we are surrounded by every day in some way or another is very hard to see clearly. But if you dig down into the most accurate data you can find, you learn that the average American makes considerably more trash than our European peers and about more than twice as much daily trash as the average Japanese consumer. Uh, more ominously, our trash footprint, what we throw in the trash cans at our homes and businesses, has doubled since 1960. So we have become increasingly trashy. Now here, you might assume in Portland, which does so many sustainable things, is really on the green side of, of, of so many things, you might be tempted to believe that things are a little better on the trash front, but I'd have to tell you, you have to think again. Portlanders actually make slightly more trash than the national average according to the most recent numbers I was able to find. It is true that you recycle at a much higher rate here, but uh, recycling is kind of a, a half solution. It's wasteful in itself. It's not the same as not being wasteful. It's kind of like being less bad rather than being good. You do recycle well, though. You are doing that part well. Uh, you're still sending 50 or more big diesel rigs a day packed with your trash 150 plus miles away, a 300 plus mile round trip, uh, a considerable impact on the environment to take your trash to oh, somebody else's backyard. Uh, the dirty secret about our trash is that even our greenest communities have a long way to go uh, to be good. Now trash isn't, isn't particularly pretty, but it is fascinating, it's perversely fascinating. I, I commend all of you to hang out at a landfill sometime, as as I did. Uh, uh, be prepared for things you do not expect to see and don't want, don't want to smell, but uh, it is uh, the only way you can clearly see the, the physical manifestation of our personal wastefulness. I mean, that is, I mean, trash and waste, we think of it as, uh, as the inevitable detritus of our commerce and our lives and, it, and of having no value in it because we're throwing it away, right? But what it is is the manifestation of us wasting things. And we have the worldwide crown in, the, in how much we do that with in terms of developed nations. That's normal for us because one thing we're really good at in America is managing our waste. You notice we now call the departments and, or the companies that dispose of our things where it's the waste prevention agencies, it's waste management. And that means we're hiding our waste from ourselves. We roll to the curb each week or every two weeks, whatever your local system calls for, and it kind of just disappears, you know, to think about it. So my goal in writing Garbology was to uh, sort of be your eyes and ears and nose and, and entertain you and horrify you with stories about, um, about our waste, about our trash about where it goes and what's in it uh, and who's dealing with it. Uh, the reason I wanted to do this story, it stems from two earlier books I did that had environmental themes and whether I was talking to people about uh, deforestation or climate change or energy policy or business sustainability, the un an underlying factor was always waste. The stuff coming out of our tailpipes is waste, the stuff that we dump in the ocean, plastic pollution, it all, it all was about what we throw away and cast off or do it, or waste, and it seemed like a good idea to do that story. So here we are. To illustrate how trashy we are, I wanted, it's very hard to convey, oh, uh, seven pounds a day, 1.3 tons of trash per person in America. What does that look like? I mean, it's a, such a big number, it becomes hard to, to imagine. So I, I, I chose to begin the story with, um, this married couple in Chicago who had become, in their uh, retirement years, hoarders. Now, we've turned hoarding into an entertainment. There's TV shows. This was not entertaining. These folks would not throw anything away. They couldn't bear to part with anything, and their home gradually became a, 
a mishmash of old newspapers, of containers, of bottles, of rotting food, of cast off clothes, old appliances that didn't work anymore would just be pushed into a corner. I, I have a PowerPoint. I show the slides of this house, but it's some presentations. It's uh, just imagine the biggest mess you've ever seen, roof to ceiling. These folks, he was a retired chemist, she was a, uh, a former teacher, literally became trapped in their home behind the walls of trash that they had erected until finally they couldn't get out, they couldn't get food, and people hadn't seen them in some time, finally were concerned about the smell coming out of the house and went in to investigate. A rescue crew took about five or six hours to tunnel in to bring them out near death, trapped by their own garbage. Now, why should we care about such an aberrant pathological behavior? I mean, nobody you know, can be worried about behaving like that themselves. What can we learn from that? Well, it turns out the amount of trash they accumulated across two years, between five and six tons, is exactly the norm for what we all do in America. They were completely within the normal range of waste production. They just hoarded it at home instead of hoarding it in landfills. And what their house looks like is what we all look like in our trash behavior. Uh, and that's where uh, the 102 ton figure that Karen mentioned comes from. Uh, if you look at seven pounds a day, the average American lifetime, our municipal waste stream, the thing our businesses and uh, um, households throw away. If we kept it on our front lawn, each member of your household would create a 1.3 ton pile of trash on your front lawn. Then you'd get it. You'd understand what our trash really looks like. What does it look like when it goes to the landfill? I, I uh, was lucky enough to live near what was America's largest operating landfill in the Los Angeles area when uh, I was working on this book. It's called Puente Hills, usually referred to as either the Disneyland of dumps because it's got a lot going on, which I'll tell you about in a minute, or Garbage Mountain. It is a 500 foot, 1200 acre plateau mountain of trash, whatever you want to call it. When you stand atop it, you're standing atop 500 feet of pulverized, mashed, compacted trash. Um, it's impressive. It's the 12th tallest structure in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, it towers over uh, City Hall if it was next to it. It received 13,000 tons of trash a day from around the Los Angeles area. And you haven't lived until you see a fleet of these German-made bow mag, uh, they're kind of hybrid bulldozers and compactors. They have giant steel wheels. The teeth on them look like dinosaur teeth. They're six inches uh, high. And this, the shovel on the front end of this can deliver 100,000 pounds of force. And the guy's driving this, the one that I spent time with, Big Mike, he's like a surgeon with a you know, 60 ton scalpel. The, he takes this inflow of trash, and it's like looking at the prow of a ship moving through the ocean, except the waves coming off either side are, are trash, waves of trash, as he moves it into place and turns it into what's called a cell. It's like the cell in your body, not a cell in prison. It's what a landfill is made of, and these cells are the size of a football field, of compacted trash. He makes one of those every day. He has to sculpt it so it's perfectly flat. It's amazing to watch. I chose Big Mike because the head of the landfill said, oh, yeah, come over here. See that part over there? Big Mike did that. You can tell. That's his style. You know, he has a, he has a style for the trash because he gets it right. They have all these lasers and things to make it perfectly level. He doesn't use any of them, and his are always the most perfect. He does it by eye, Big Mike. Mountain of a man, you know, he's very appropriate to be making a mountain of a trash. He just looks like he was born to drive one of these bow mags. It, it, bow mag is a German series of words that I can't pronounce, so I won't even try, but it is the state of the art in landfill uh, uh, building. Now, it's funny, it's like a prowl of the ship. One of the most noticeable things at this particular landfill, and at many landfills, are the seagulls. You know, the sea of trash attracts a sea of seagulls, and, are, and they are always fighting over the garbage. And there's great measures are taken uh, to keep the seagulls at bay, because this landfill, unlike the one that Portland uses, is right in the heart of urban Los Angeles. The city grew up around Garbage Mountain as Garbage Mountain grew above the city. Uh, people do not like, like living next to this, but the, they take great pains to try and minimize their impact. The seagulls, they'll pick up an old piece of rotting meat, they'll get a pizza crust, 
and it'll get a really juicy bit of garbage and fly off with it, and all, all his seagull uh, compadres will fo follow after him and try and steal their food, and they'll have aerial dogfights for the garbage, and inevitably they'll get dropped on somebody's hydrangea bed or their car or their kid's play set, and then the complaints start coming in, and, and, the, and the council people get involved, and it's a big problem. So they go to ridiculous lengths. They have drone aircraft, little drones flying around trying to scare the, uh, the seagulls. They ha There's that two full-time people working the little you know, plane. It's, they have crews with fireworks displays and pyrotechnics to try uh, not to entertain the seagulls, although you wonder, but, but to drive them off. And then they have these monofilament fishing lines strung all over because it's been observed that seagulls have a characteristic spiral descent as they land, and if the fishing lines are there, it disrupts their instinctual landing pattern. I gotta tell you, it looked like they were fighting to a draw with the seagulls while I was there, because they, uh, they seemed to be getting what they wanted uh, more than they were driven off, but it was very entertaining to watch, hence the Disneyland of dumps aspect of the, the place. You know, the, the irony about Garbage Mountain is back in the 80s, LA wanted to do away with most of its landfills, and it was gonna do that by building these enormous waste to energy plants. Uh, it was very controversial because there was environmental concerns about burning trash. That technology has improved over time to, to actually, it has less of a carbon footprint when you burn trash in a modern facility than putting it in landfills. Landfills are the third largest source of methane emissions in, in America right now. So it, they're not benign at all. But nobody knew that back then. Nobody was talking about climate. The main concern in the area where Puente Hills now is they didn't want that 250 foot tall smokestack despoiling their view. So they said, we don't want the smokestack. We don't want that plant. What they didn't know is they were going to get a 500 foot tall mountain of garbage instead, which is considerably more of an impact on the, her <laughs> the skyline. Uh, and you would not, it is a geographic feature in a way, but you wouldn't mistake it for a, a natural one because all these, like, it's crazy looking. You know, it has these terrace things that, so that the, they're called benches, so that the garbage can be stacked uh, in a simulation of a mountain. And then there's pipes coming out all over the place. It looks like some crazy giant's plumbing on top of this landfill. It's, it's bizarre looking. And that's to siphon off the methane. This is one of the minority of landfills that tries to capture all the methane that comes from the rotting garbage. And they built a power plant at the top of this uh, landfill in order to take this methane. It makes enough electricity for 50,000 homes and will do so for the next 20 years, even if you don't add any more garbage to Garbage Mountain. So it's a lot of rotting garbage. All right. so. I have to tell you a little bit, I, I mentioned at the start that we underestimate our trash. The EPA does this sort of a trash Bible every year uh, to tell you that we make 4.4 pounds of trash a year and uh, throw, uh, uh, I don't have my chart with me, but it's about 260 uh, million tons of trash away. These numbers are wildly wrong. Uh, they've been wrong for many years because the EPA doesn't weigh a single pound of trash in order to come up with these numbers. They do this arcane calculation. I won't go into the details, but it's based on goods produced, what their expected lifespan is, when people can be expected to throw them away. They do a couple samples to figure out yard waste and come up with a number. And they did it this way because back in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, there were something like 12,000 landfills. A lot of them were illegal dumps. Nobody could count the trash. It was the best they could do. Well, we only have about 1,200 landfills now. They weigh every pound going in. That's their business model. You can get the data. They just don't. Uh, and it turns out they lost 140 million tons of trash by not actually counting it. So they way underestimated and overestimated our recycling rates. We don't recycle as much as they say either. So we've gotten an artificially rosy picture. Uh, the real number is 389 million tons of trash. That's where the 7.1 pounds comes from and where the calculation that in an average American life, you'll throw away 102 tons of trash. I try to picture what 102 tons looks like. Can I, I don't know, if I, it's hard. So I figured out that um, you know how we all get one, one grave in life if we're buried at the end of it. When our trash is buried, it takes up the equivalent of 1,100 graves. That's you know, how much we're leaving behind. One of the cool things about uh, 
trash is it's become such an important expert for us. So I don't know if it's cool. It's actually a pretty bad business model for us, but what happens is a lot of our pa uh, paper and scrap goes to, to China uh, inside the containers that would otherwise cross back empty. Um, and the first woman billionaire in China became a billionaire by figuring out that she could get a great deal in these empty containers. She was living in Pomona at the time, although she's a Chinese national, Pomona, California, and started selling scrap cardboard and paper uh, to Chinese manufacturers who had deforested the country in order to package products for us. So they were getting the paper back, the uh, pennies on the dollar, making new products out of it. She built a paper plan on the other side called Nine Dragons and became a billionaire. So it was a great business model for her, but it's turned America into China's trash compactor. That's kind of our role now. Uh, it's a little depressing. Uh, California's second most valuable export is its trash to, to China through the port of Los Angeles. I see it go out every day. It's not too far from me. Interesting about what is in our trash, the single biggest component, can you guess what it is? Don't say dirty diapers, a lot of people do think it is that, uh, but it's, it, it's packaging, it's containers, it's our disposable products and the things that contain them. Uh, more recycling nationwide goes to landfills than uh, recyclables, such as our containers and packages, than actually get recycled. We're really bad at this recycling thing. Again, Portland is one of the great exceptions to that. Uh, you are actually recycling more of your trash than uh, sending recyclables to landfill, so that's laudable. One of the products I want to talk to you, one of these wasteful products I want to mention to you is junk mail. Uh, it's a very popular uh, product, uh, at least for people who send it. Do you know one out of 100 pounds of trash going to our landfills is junk mail by weight? One out of 100 pounds. That's a significant part of the waste stream. And it's crazy. It's a subsidized product, artificially low postal rate, you know, paid for by the higher postal rates you and I have to pay, the junk mailers get a deal. And then it's subsidized again, because who cleans up this wasteful product? The junk mailers don't have to come and clean it up or pay for its disposal. The taxpayers or, or government agencies or consumers are picking up the tab for the junk mail. So it's got a double subsidy. It's a perverse incentive to make a wasteful product that nobody actually wants. Uh, it's crazy. And, and you think, well, uh, that's just junk mail. But these kinds of perverse incentives that encourage waste rather than encourage not waste, uh, riddle our economy. And one of the favorite parts of the book for me, Garbology, uh, was Recology's program in San Francisco. Uh, the uh, sanitation company sponsors artists and residents. You have a similar program here, but these guys actually stay at the dump for three months and they get paid for it. And they make uh, art, not only do they have to use the materials for their artwork, but they have to find the tools for their art in the dump. You know, if they need paintbrushes, they better find them in the trash. If they need uh, uh, sculpting tools, whatever, they have to find it there. Uh, one of the uh, philharmonic uh, composers came there and made uh, an orchestra's worth of instruments out of, <laughs> out of the trash. Don't get the CD. It's, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, but it was interesting. We had one uh, wood carver made the entire cast of, of uh, trash puppets to and did a reenactment of uh, Dante's Inferno. It was awesome. Uh, and apropos, uh, Andrew Jung, he's this uh, kind of realism, uh, super realistic sculptor. He made a life-size Humvee out of styrofoam, you know, like the bits of styrofoam that he found in, you know, cu styrofoam foam cups and, and uh, clamshells and, and that sort of thing. And he had to glue it all together. He had to find the glue in the waste, in, in the dump, and he did. He found everything he needed, and it's an incredible uh, work of art. Uh, when it, it was interesting, because the, the incoming crop of, of artists would worry that they wouldn't be able to do what they needed to do. There's one, uh, Lauren DeCosio. She makes these beautiful sewn sculptures, these three-dimensional sculptures, and she was doing, she wanted to do things she'd find at the dump. People's photo albums, uh, board games, uh, little appliances, uh, relics from you know antique. I mean, just really cool stuff she'd find. But her big fear was, how am I going to sew? I'm not allowed to bring my sewing kit. I, <laughs> and the outgoing artist looked at her and said, you know, if you need it, it will come. <laughs> it always comes. And within two weeks, she had two like professional class seamstress kits. And, uh, how, how can that be? Well, it's, 
if you think about it, what happened is some, somebody died. Some granny died, and there was nobody who wanted her stuff, but she had been a, a retired seamstress because it was real old school stuff. The spools were still made out of wood, and the tools were, uh, you could see, were beautifully cared for, but were old. And, uh, you know, somebody's treasure had become trash. That's the real story that these artists help reveal. And schools come through on tours all the time uh, to see this work and, and experience what these artists experience because we really are throwing away things that have incredible value and doing it every day because it always comes, whatever they need. Somebody throws it away. I, I would sit and just watch the trucks coming in uh, at, at the Garbage Mountain to see what was being dumped loads of food, milk, things that were barely out of date but still perfectly good, furniture, mattresses and box springs, I mean, there's stacks of them. Uh, one time there was this load of jacuzzis being dumped. And I wasn't supposed to talk to the people coming and dumping because I didn't have the releases, but I had to ask, why are you dumping these jacuzzis? I and mean, they look brand new. And he said, well, they're last year's model. <laughs> it was e this was during the height of the recession and homes were being foreclosed on in some areas of California at just horrendous rates. And they had to empty them out, the people were gone, they were leaving the keys and just walking away. Uh, and the easiest thing to do, what do you think happened to all the material in the house, the clothes and the furniture, anything that was left behind? It didn't go on Craigslist, which you know, might have made sense. It got taken to the dump and thrown away. Just a tidal wave of perfectly good stuff but it was somebody's trash at that point. That's a little depressing, actually, isn't it? <laughs> uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about recycling, because I said at the top that it's, it's not a great strategy. It's the better than nothing strategy. It's important to do, but we've got it backwards. You know, we, it's been treated like the go-to solution for trash, but the economics of it, except for aluminum, really stink. You know, a lot of the material you get out of recycling, first of all, there's always a residue left. If you recycle plastic, you can get 10 or 15% this lump that you can't do anything with. It still has to go to the landfill. It's energy intensive, and the material often doesn't, you know, nobody wants. It's like recycling plastic shopping bags is um, possible. Uh, it's 100% recyclable, but only about 5% gets recycled because it's expensive and nobody wants it. Uh, it's just not a good model. So. Think of it as, as kind of really bad alchemy. You know, the alchemists wanted to make lead into gold. Recycling is making gold into lead. That's what we're getting. Uh, it has some value, but only if you try and couple it with, on the front end, reducing the flow of waste in the first place. Not wasting, not having wasteful things is a way better strategy than trying to waste it and then make something out of it. It just, it, it doesn't pay off. Aluminum being the only exception to that, that's the perfect case for recycling because it's cheaper to have recycled aluminum than to dig it up and uh, refine it. But there's very few materials that can make that case. Now I want to talk to you about the trash that gets away. This is a part of the book that horrified me most. It's plastic pollution in the ocean. Have you guys heard of the garbage patch, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? A lot of people have a misconception about that because uh, I was hanging out with the scientists who go out and, and, and try and measure it and see what its impact is. And there's this idea that it's a floating landfill, that there's big hunks of garbage floating out there, and if only we could go out and scoop it up, everything would be fine. If that's really what it was, if it was a floating landfill, that would be great, because it wouldn't be as harmful as what's really out there, which is microplastics, small plastics. Uh, nature can't absorb plastics. It doesn't get, uh, de it doesn't decompose the way organic material does, but it does break down from sun and wave action into ever smaller particles until it resembles the size and shape, though not the color, of plankton. Well, there's a lot of organisms at the bottom of the food chain that feed on plankton, and now they're feeding on plant plankton and plastic in certain parts of the water. And you think the ocean is big, but the problem is that we're putting a lot of plastic in the ocean. About 10% of what we make in plastic gets lost along the way. It, <laughs> it doesn't make it to the landfill, and it ends up oftentimes in the ocean or through the uh, products that we use and don't realize are filled with plastic, like those lovely exfoliating scrubs. Well, you know, I got to tell you, most of those products, you're scrubbing yourself with plastic beads, and those are going right down the drain. Our washing machines are really good at shredding polyester, so you have 
or any polyester or other plastic in your clothes, and most of us have something like that in the wardrobe. Plastic fibers are detaching from them in the washing machine, and those are also entering the waterway, and not all of it gets filtered out. So the ocean is a big repository for plastic. It's also a big repository for different chemicals that aren't good for us, many of which are not water soluble. So what happens when oil and water mix? That oily substance is always looking for something to cling to. So now, voila, you have these little abraded, broken down bits of plastic, and they get hitchhikers toxic chemicals that are in the ocean. And that's what's entering our food chain, and that's the scary part. And we're only beginning to understand that we're conducting a 50-year experiment on what happens if we start filling the ocean up with plastic particles that attract toxic chemicals that are entering the food chain, our food chain. Because those plankton eaters that gobble up the plastic are eaten by bigger and bigger fish until it gets to the ones that we depend on as a principal food supply in many parts of the world. So. Welcome to your life as a lab rat, because we are the experiment. And uh, we're only beginning to understand that we've done something really uh, harmful that is going to be very hard to clean up, if not impossible. Uh, the only strategy now is to avoid making it worse. I tried to calculate how much, wh what the amount of plastic that's going into the ocean is like. And the closest I can come is, it's the weight equivalent of losing 40 super aircraft carriers at sea each year. And can you picture that fleet? There's only 10 in the US Navy, but picture 40 of them, biggest ships in the military, in the Navy, anywhere in the world, floating airports. And think how much plastic it would take to weigh as much as that steel, <laughs> which those ships are made of. That's how much is being lost in the ocean every year. Super. All right, so how about some good news? I want to wrap up with the good news because the part of the story of garbology, after I've depressed you all, is the way back. It's the most exciting part. It's what people want to talk about because there is a way back from this, this uh, depressing waste story um, because a lot of it revolves around the choices we make. Uh, one of the choices a lot of communities in California, I know Portland's done it, uh, is to eliminate one, one of the most visible wasteful products we have, the plastic bag. Um, and that's led to other moves. Some communities are banning these facial scrubs. When New York is looking at the entire state of getting rid of um, microplastics in these, these scrubs, that's a positive step. And they were inspired by the bag ban. Um, people are turning from all kinds of wasteful choices. Uh, and so are big companies. I'm gonna, you know, I, I know uh, it's not popular to say so, but uh, Walmart has been a leader in this area. And they've been a subject of a lot of, yeah, I hear like Snickers. I always get that reaction here, uh, particularly. But uh, for all their well-deserved criticism, Walmart um, has reduced their landfilling by over 80% uh, in its US operations. I challenge Portland to match that. Uh, they don't do it because it makes them greener. They do it because it makes them money or saves them money. It makes them more competitive. Um, and they've gone about it with the kind of single-minded attention that, that Walmart is famous for uh, in, in other areas. And how do they do it? They eliminate packaging. They recycle more. They, uh, they compost their food waste and sell it. So they've actually turned it into a revenue stream rather than a cost. And uh, it, they've been a, a leader in convincing other parts of corporate America that uh, maybe this environmental crap isn't so bad after all, at least when it comes to uh, waste reduction. They have become, uh, uh, entered a leadership position. 80% in a company the size of Walmart reduction in landfilling is not insignificant. Um, and they've also been a leader in reducing packaging, which reduces waste of all kinds. Um, they're the reason that detergent bottles tend to be smaller now because, well, they wanted to fit more on the shelf and they wanted to spend less money in shipping, but one of the consequences because the bigger bottles only contain more water and more plastic to hold that water, um, we're saving water. We're using less plastic. We're using less packaging and shipping and fuel and energy. So a business decision and an environmental gain on the waste front go hand in hand. It turns out a lot of the less wasteful choices we make are good business decisions. Uh, and they also scale down to family level decisions. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't big groups 
and organizations who've pioneered these bag bans. That's a community effort. Those are activists, those are individuals who are striving for a waste change. And it's interesting to see how it's worked out. LA County's had it for three years now. And the way it works there is no plastic bags. Um, first in the large retailers, now all stores, even the mom and pop stores, can't no plastic bags. And they have to charge a dime for paper bags. Is it the same here? Is that how it works here? You have the dime charge? No? Nobody knows? OK. Well, that's how it works. Uh, and it, it's interesting because people hated it at first. And I was at Trader Joe's on the first day of they didn't have the plastic bags to begin with. But now that you have to pay a dime for the bag, oh, boy. The reaction, it's a dime, right? People were not using the bag. They wouldn't pay the dime. They were carrying out their groceries. <laughs> Cans were dropping on toes. You know, People were howling in the parking lot. They swore there was going to be a repeal, that they were going to bag the bag ban. What, let, let's look a year later from that. This is three years ago. A year later, the stores who oppose it are deliriously happy because they get to keep the dime. But they're even happier because they don't need so many bags of any kind anymore because 75% reduction in disposable bag use has occurred in Los Angeles County in one year from one dime. Changed an entire urban area's behavior. You know, you think these things can't be changed, but that's pretty amazing. And again, this was pushed through by community activists who uh, observed the wisdom of um, company called Chico Bags, Andy Keller makes these reusable bags and they're kind of unique because they, they scrunch up into a little hecky sack sized uh, ball so you can keep it in your pocket and take it with you, it's they're pretty cool. And uh, he says that plastic bags are the gateway drug of waste, kind of in reverse because once you get rid of those bags which you thought you couldn't do without, and you start saying, hey, these reusable bags are okay, or you know, I can, I can get 18 uses out of my paper bag, or whatever. Maybe you're using old plastic bags that you never threw away. Anything you're reusing isn't being wasted, right? Once you realize you can do without that, then you start looking uh, at other things. Maybe I don't need to buy that bottled water, the contents of which cost more per ounce than gasoline. Maybe I can just use my tap water in a reusable container, or maybe that plastic fork. You know, I visited a college uh, to talk about the book uh, and, and participate in their talk and trash event uh, in California, and they uh, had done away with clamshell containers for takeout. They were going through thousands of them a week, uh, mostly foam. Now they take a deposit from every student at the beginning of the year, and they get a reusable, washable clamshell. They don't even have to wash it themselves. They can just get a clean one and have sort of exchange it. They'll wash it at the cafeteria, and at the end of the year, if they return them, they get their money back. Everybody loves it. I mean, they cut a whole portion of the waste stream out, and they did it like that. You know, or once you make one little choice like that, the others come on. Well, you know, I, I met this family, the Johnson family, and I wrote about them. Um, and Bea Johnson, uh, who's an artist, uh, mother of two, and her husband, really got into the zero waste thing. They wanted to, and they did it pre for practical reasons at first. They had to move into a smaller house. They had to downsize because of a job change. And they went from, I don't know, like 3,300 square feet to 1,500 square feet. Well, how do you fit all the stuff that we have in a big house into a small house? You start evaluating it. And they said, well, why did we even buy half this stuff? We don't need this stuff. We don't use this stuff. That couch, nobody sits on it. Uh, and they sort of went through everything and then also began reevaluating just how they consume in general. And Bea got really excited about this and decided she wanted to experiment on just trying to shrink waste of all kinds. So she stopped buying packaged and processed food, which comes in wrappers and boxes and envelopes, and started buying fresh food. And she'd bring her own containers to markets that would allow her to do that. So they'd weigh her jar and then put the stuff in it and then weigh it again, and she'd pay for it. There'd be no wrapping. And she kept doing things like this. Uh, she stopped patronizing stores that used plastic spoons when they gave her kids the ice cream bowl and let, until they changed and made something more uh, less wasteful available, and so forth. They kept doing this, uh, and, and pretty soon, after about a year of this effort, they did two things. First, they saw that after they recycled and after they composted, uh, their year's worth of trash fit into a mason jar the stuff that would go to a landfill. And the second thing they discovered is their household budget had shrunk by 
They were saving that money because they were just not buying. So, and they were eating healthier and fresher. So look at the benefits of trying to be less wasteful. They saved money. They had just come back from Hawaiian vacation when they told me this and <laughs> that they couldn't otherwise have afforded. Uh, you're eating healthier, so they're in, uh, encouraging their health, and uh, they're being green. They're pretty, ex they're on the extreme end. I don't know that every family could be like Bea Johnson. She's kind of like <laughs> unrelenting, but most families could do, <clears throat> do half of what the Johnson family does and hardly break a sweat because it's really a lot of common sense stuff. She does this little rubric. Whenever they go and buy something, she asks a series of questions, and this is what I encourage you to think about. Um, is there a usable alternative to this disposable item? That's question number one. Can I buy this food as fresh food, unpackaged or in bulk, rather than packaged and, and wrapped in plastic? Big question, do I really need this? Uh, is this something I'm gonna want in my house after a year? Is it gonna be an heirloom? Or is it gonna end up at the landfill in a year? What's the cost of owning this rather than the cost at the cash register? Because that leads you to more durable and less disposable choices. Very thoughtful approach. It changes the way she and her family consumes. Big thing that she's into is buying used. Um, other people call it vintage, but then you have to pay more. But it's, it's the same thing. The, the reuse economy and its cousin, the sharing economy, are huge waste killers. Uh, you know, it's, Craigslist is the, probably the biggest anti-landfill there is uh, because things that would have been thrown away are now finding new lives and it's strengthening local economy. So it's uh, lowering the transport of goods that we're getting. It has so many benefits and, and you know, it's become much cooler too to, <laughs> to buy vintage. Uh, celebrities are advocating it, so it must be good. Um, okay, so there is a way back. There's all kinds of strategies we can use and it doesn't have to be hard. You know, you think about how insurmountable envir environmental problems, including waste, can seem. And I was watching this YouTube video of one of the middle schoolers in uh, the Johnson family making uh, the special lunch to bring. He, and this, he was demonstrating how you take a napkin. It's a Japanese technique. Someone just told me how to pronounce it, but I forgot it already. But you fold your napkin into a series of compartments, and one has the cookie or the apple in it, and one has the sandwich. Everything's segregated, and you fold it all up, you bring it to school, you take it there, you open it up, there's your food, it's on the placemat. When you finish your food, you wipe with a napkin, you bring it back home. Zero waste lunch, right? It's cool. The other, he, so he was doing this, the only one in the school doing this, little middle schooler, but he does this video, and the other kids see how they do it, and like half the school starts doing it. And all of a sudden, you have this school full of zero waste lunch eaters, and then their trash cans don't have all the stuff in it that they used to. And they're all eating healthier, too, because of the kind of thing, you don't put a Lunchable inside a napkin, you put, you know, an apple inside it, right? I went to another school, a talk of, uh, in the Palos Verdes Peninsula, this high school, and they were trying to really get rid of the trash. They were trying to um, get everybody to put their stuff in recycling bins, and it wasn't happening. And um, one of the, during the Q&A, this girl stood up and said, well, here's the reason, you know, we, um, I'm carrying our books. I got my cell phone out because I can only call during passing or you know, message anybody. And, and then um, the recycling bins had a lid on it and the trash can didn't. So we're juggling all this stuff and we got our food and it was just easier just to dump it in the trash can. So I said, well, what would it take for you to you know, change that behavior? And she thought a minute and she said, they could give me a cookie. Uh, how about cookies? And so I look at the principal and I said, well, can you give them cookies? So, okay, we'll do that. Let's do a, a reward for being, getting caught being good and recycling instead of throwing it in the trash can and we'll give out cookies. So now the recycling bins are being used. The kids are getting their cookies. Silly little thing. But, I mean, look at it. A dime, a napkin, and a cookie have changed behaviors of whole communities and making them less wasteful. So maybe it's just not as insurmountable as we might think that there is hope, there is a way back. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Ed. This is fascinating information and, and a little bit depressing as you mentioned. Um, 
Thank you for not having water bottles here, by the way. <laughs> so if you have written a question on an index card, please hold it up high so that City Club staff can collect it from you. And we will now take questions from the floor. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at Friday Forum microphone is a benefit of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. Before asking your question, please state your name and identify yourself as a City Club member. Please ask only one question and ask it as succinctly as possible. If I flash this question mark card, please wrap up your question. Leslie Johnson, City Club member. Uh, Mr. Hume, I was a little bit surprised somebody didn't shout out what is happening with grocery bags here because with the plastic ban, um, there isn't any citywide mandate, but most, um, most grocery stores and retail outlets will offer you a discount if you bring your own bags. And I, you, you mentioned all those different small rewards or penalties. There was some discussion about some kind of rule about bringing your own bags or using the paper bags. Is there any research about which works better, the penalty or the reward, however small, in these kinds of settings? Uh, I know that the most effective ones have been where there's a charge uh, for using a disposable bag because it, it does change people's behavior. So I don't know, I haven't seen anything that takes any kind of rigorous look at uh, the effect of a reward. Um, so, sorry. Um, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, as you probably know, in Portland we have uh, um, three barrels. Uh, a blue barrel for newspapers and cans and so forth, a green barrel for compostables, and a black barrel for garbage. Um, uh, does the green barrel with compostable significantly reduce um, uh, trash and uh, the problem of disposal? Well, uh, the short answer to that is yes. I mean, if it's being sent to a composting facility of some sort, or if you're doing home composting for that matter, uh, the, uh, you know, then it's not ending up in a landfill. And since food waste is one of the uh, creators of the methane emissions, it has a double benefit. So it also is lowering the carbon footprint of things that are going to the landfill as well. So yeah, if it's really being composted. But you know, a lot of communities put things in recycling bins. Pe people put the wrong things in them, and they don't get recycled, or they don't have the capability of being recycled, like like plastic shopping bags. So just because you're putting it in the right bin isn't a guarantee that it's landing where you you want it to. Ted K, City Club member, I'm interested in your discussing the life cycle cost of an item as opposed to just the cash register cost of an item. And also the idea that you talked about the cookie or the dime. Uh, there's two economic concepts here. One is uh, externalities and the other is incentives. And I'm wondering to what extent uh, the political or economic structure of our society can start to internalize the life cycle costs of items so that people are getting the incentives through the pricing mechanism. They know that something just costs more if it has a bigger trash impact than something else, and they would just make their decisions based on the price, which is a great way to provide people incentives. Well, that's, that's the core problem, and you identified it very eloquently, that the externalities of our products right now create an in incentive to, to make wasteful choices. Um, it's, you know, it's, uh, the manufacturers of plastic aren't responsible for the plastic waste in our ocean. Well, I mean, morally they are responsible, but legally and economically they're not. The same goes for junk mail, and the same goes for a lot of other products. And we're, we're, we have only a very nascent kind of uh, movement right now to, um, to, to have producers be responsible for, uh, for the consequences of the wasteful aspect of their product. It, it, it does make sense, and that would be a kind of incentive. If there was a cost attached to making a wasteful product, then it would be an incentive to create less wasteful ones. 
Um, so far, it's mostly a voluntary effort. You have companies like the Patagonia company that says when you're done with something we make, send it back to us and we will repurpose it. Please don't throw it away. Uh, there's not a lot of companies out there doing that. Um, but uh, encouraging that kind of behavior is really the, would be a keystone event uh, in terms of reducing the flow of our waste. Um, I think Europe is a little ahead of us on, on this, but it's still happening slowly. San Francisco is looking at starting with mattresses and box springs and requiring manufacturers to be responsible for them. They're a problem at landfills. Um, they're a universal product, but they're only bought infrequently, so it's a good test to see if manufacturers will be willing to um, either take them back or make them so they can more easily be repurposed when they're thrown away or disposed of. Uh, and the potential uh, stick, if they don't want to do that, is you can't do business in San Francisco. So that hasn't happened yet, but they're talking about it. But that is the kind of change that would be required to make a less wasteful consumer economy. And whether that could ever happen, I don't know. Paddy Tillett, City Club member. In Europe, it's not unusual to see people at the front of a supermarket store or an electronics store unwrapping the goods they've just bought and leaving all the packaging there as a means of protest to having too much packaging. Have you seen any of that sort of militancy here? Uh, no, actually. <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. I, I've noticed we have, if anything, we have more packaging than things in Europe. I, you know, I saw toothpaste tubes for sale in Europe that don't come in a box, you know, because why would you put a structurally stronger tube inside a structurally weaker box? I, I don't know why we do that, but that's our habit. We have a lot of habitually wasteful practices that Europeans have already dispensed with, so maybe they're more prone to, to protest uh, when, when uh, products fall down in that regard. We're just used to it here. We have a couple of questions from audience members. Can you comment on the impact of online shopping and packaging? Can I comment on that? Well, other than we're probably seeing an increase in the packaging containing the packaging because things are being shipped that might otherwise have been just picked up off a, a shelf. I'm thinking of Amazon and its you know, Prime program. Uh, which encourages people to, if you're a member of that, to just keep ordering, ordering, ordering s separately because you don't have to pay for the shipping. So it's kind of an incentive for, for wastefulness because there's no economy in, in being less wasteful involved. So, so there's some aspects of online shopping that are creating more waste and then there's whole distance thing. We're using more energy to ship than, well, we still have to go to the store and pick it up. So. Uh, another uh, audience question, audience member question, what are some state and federal laws that can encourage us to reduce waste? What are some that could or that are in place? Well, some that can encourage us or some that are in place, e either way. Well, I think that uh, we're seeing more action at the local and state level. Um, uh, Local communities have been very nimble on the plastic bag front and some of the other um, regulations that are being passed on um, uh, plastic water bottles. Um, states have been much slower to, uh, the first state that finally um, did a statewide bag ban was Hawaii, and not coincidentally, they have an enormous ocean plastic pollution problem, mostly other people's plastic coming to them. Um, so they're very sensitive to that issue, but uh, the likelihood of any kind of federal environmental legislation that's going to change behavior now is, I think, um, about as likely as my airliner taking me to the moon today when I go back to California. Uh, you know, the golden age of all this big environmental legislation was the late 60s, early 70s, um, when that crazy liberal Richard Nixon was in office and, and, and signed the Endangered Species Act. Uh, we're not going to see that anytime soon. So it's up to local and some state governments to take these, these issues on where they can be. And they can have a huge effect. And the final question that we have today, and if you can answer this, uh, is where is Portland's garbage taken to? 
Well, actually, this is a really good question because uh, that is now the subject of um, great debate for the next five years, which is when the uh, contract for the current uh, disposal method uh, uh, will lapse. And everything apparently is on the table now to see what, uh, whether we'll continue with business as usual or choose some other options for, for Portland's waste. So it's actually exciting times for, for the future of trash here. But right now, um, the majority of, of the metropolitan area's waste is taken to a landfill uh, in Arlington, is it? In Washington? Or on the border with Washington? And um, uh, that's uh, more than a 300 mile round trip, about 50, I thought it was 60, but I was told it's more like 50 uh, big rigs a day full of trash. So that's, that's not a great sustainability model, so I'm sure that'll be scrutinized. And then there's a portion of trash that also goes to a, a closer landfill uh, river bend, I believe, which has its contents are about 40% of Portland Star. So you have no landfill uh, to speak of within uh, the immediate area of the city. So it's all remote, which is more picturesque for you, but probably not the most green choice you could make. And actually, Ed and I were talking briefly before the program started, and you mentioned uh, a landfill, several landfills that were built on, but Maybe you could talk a little bit about the landfill that was built on in um, Manhattan. Uh, yes, well, not many people know this, but Wall Street is built on a, a landfill. Uh, and some of you may think that's appropriate. They, <laughs> but um, its contents have actually been, um, as, as tr ancient trash uh, usually becomes, it becomes an archaeological site instead of a, a mound of waste. But it, a lot of its contents are... Um, old uh, Dutch sailing ships that were wrecked or, or um, abandoned and mashed and put in there with a lot of other trash and waste material uh, in order to fill in the, the swamp that <laughs> is, again, now Wall Street. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, the precursor to Garbage Mountain in Los Angeles um, closed, oh, 25 years ago now. It's still giving off a little methane, but its primary function is as a beautiful botanical garden. So, you know, landfills can become useful parts of uh, the world. Right now, Seattle is uh, tunneling through the old fill that um, uh, uh, dried out its waterfront area, from, and uh, it's causing them a little problem because the biggest tunneling machine in the world is stuck in it right now and it's wreaking havoc with their traffic. They're trying to dig a tunnel to put traffic underneath the city rather than on top of it, so that's an interesting experiment, but it's stuck on trash right now, so go figure. Thank you. We have run out of broadcast time for further questions, and we'll have to stop for the day. And as we close, please join me in offering our sincere thanks to Ed Humes, as well as Metro, for their partnership on this event. Thanks for listening. Right now, Seattle. Uh.